I am currently 23 years old and I've been a professional chess player since I was 10. Pretty much obsessing over openings since day one. However, more recently, there is one variation that genuinely keeps me up at night because the strategy is so effective, I can only compare it with a properly executed service and volley in tennis. No matter how good you are, there is just not much you can do about it. I'm referring to the Kole Zuckertort, an opening where you just need to know how to set up every single one of your pieces. And with this, pretty much, you're already set. You can start your own games, have a little bit of fun with this. However, before you go, I'd advise you to watch at least one of these games, because I promise, give me 10 minutes of your time, and I'm gonna change your perspective about openings forever. Right, everybody, managed to get a white game. I'm gonna open up with d4, and let's see what we're gonna get. Okay, opponent starting with c6, so this is probably the kind of player that is just, you know, genuinely trying to play the Karo Khan defense, but he does not know that uh, the Karo Khan defense obviously can only be played against e4. Therefore, he just does it against uh, anything, you know, it's... Uh, Definitely something that can be pretty awkward, like uh, you set up a date uh, with the girl, it goes well, and uh, you know, at the end you realize she had a penis, so uh, for a lot of you that may be a big turn off, however, I would argue that it depends on the size. So, opponent playing d5, how are we gonna deal with this setup as a Kole Zuckertort player? He's doing this thing, you are gonna be playing e3. And, uh, well, the nice thing about the Colette Zuckertort is that uh, most of our pieces are generally going to develop on these same squares. So generally, knight goes to d2, bishop to d3. And then what do we do with this bad boy? We fianchero. b3, bishop to b2. Uh, okay, that is what really differentiates it from any other Cole variation. The fact that you play b3, bishop b2 makes it to be the Zucker Tort or Zuckerberg if you're like 12. So goes G6. Now usually I would say whenever you see G6 played by your opponent, you should have this thingy on your radar. However, for now I think we can just stick with normal development. We do that. You can pretty much close your eyes. Play these moves. And pray there is no penis. So, I'm just gonna do this. King to f8. Uh, okay, my guess is opponent just a uh, mouse slip, but we're gonna play it as it is, okay? Just, it is not gonna change, uh, I mean, hopefully, much of how this game is gonna go. But what I really want you to pay attention to is the fact that uh, we managed to develop all these pieces and, you know, just look at how uh, the pawns are being placed. This is just the purest form of the uh, college Zucker Tort. Once you do this, you want to know that uh, it's about to, we're about to engage, okay? The, okay. Honestly, you've got two main moves uh, when you're trying to become a bit more aggressive with this opening. So, first and foremost, what is going to be happening most of the times, it is knight e5. That's basically our biggest plan. However, in some situations, a move like e4 also makes sense. Just have to kind of uh appreciate like if for instance knight e5 it is a move that he can easily deal with then maybe you want to consider e4 here i'm just gonna stick with it and once you play knight e5 unless they take the very next move that you want to be playing is f4 okay very important it is almost as you're playing uh, a london system you put the knight on e5 and then you play f4 i think this is the so-called like uh pillsbury knight I mean, that is just a very evil knight, guys, if you have never seen the Pillsbury Knight. 
This guy is literally sleeping while he's standing. He, 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 you're not messing around with this guy in the stable. It's the best horse out there. The knight on e5. So, next part, okay, of the Koletsuka thought. You really want to be paying attention to this. You bring out your queen. And it usually maneuvers itself uh, all the way to h3. Sometimes queen f3 is also being played just to kind of get... Uh, additional control over the first square like imagine opponent had like a proper setup and a knight on f6 not a bishop this jump can sometimes be an issue as uh, you're gonna see in this video but okay opponent not doing much and even though he is not doing much i think this is gonna be ultra instructive because you just get to see how to you know actually deliver all of these attacking moves so knight to a6 Okay, the thing with knight a6 is like, it can easily be ignored. But one of the main things that uh, you want to watch out for as a Kali player is the enemy knight trying to eliminate the bishop, which is one of your main attackers. So for this reason, we play the prophylactic a3. Okay, this is a very important move, not allowing knight to b4. Please bishop to g7. Okay, very common sense stuff by my opponent. I'm considering stuff like this, probably preparing knight f5, so... Usually a move like g4, okay, is not gonna hurt. I'm just saying. We're gonna play g4. We're getting a bit of a, like an off-meta setup. Just because of the fact that he got a Fianchiero somehow. Huh, and he's like not making any moves. But I think this is still gonna be good. So we're gonna play g5. And usually on c5, it's going to be very interesting to take because you get this uh, additional pressure. Just place the knight there. Now when he plays knight f5, I'm like really considering to take. So I'm going to do queen h4. I could also be rook f3 just to be a little bit more subtle because I'm setting up this. But I'm not making my intentions clear yet. I may be just, you know, doubling up rooks. So he plays the move uh, f6, which is uh, typical. I think we want to do knight g4. We're generally happy to open things up. And I could have also, you know, in some positions you have ideas to completely sacrifice the knight. However, I stick with like the simple move. And okay, he's trying to set up a blockade. I don't think that should generally work for him because it's a very passive position, but he can try. It's gonna go back onto the like central square and we're gonna have to like speed up a little. But there is for sure this thingy that looks very terrifying. Also, if you can get a knight on to f4, like getting it to e2 and then to f4, it's usually gonna make your position great. Now, kind of the unlucky part is even if we win this pawn, it's not gonna be like that uh, simple. So I'm gonna start by maneuvering first. Yeah, he's trying to set up a relatively solid fortress. We'll give him that. So I think you want to get knight g3 all the way to f4 and then a4 bishop a3. And then try to look for tactics. I think that's the plan. So I'm just gonna yeah try to play very fast because it would be a huge pity not to win this game. It's gonna be a very beautiful positional squeeze for the Tsuka thought. Uh... Yeah, I, I literally just want to do that. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. if he, he's not careful, he may blunder a fork, but probably not going to happen. Next, I want to improve the bishop, because bishop's currently not doing much, just staring into this pawn. Oh, he, he literally blundered that. Wow. <laughs> I, I swear, this guy's not like a paid actor, but, you know, I, I'll give you guys a pro tip. If you say, if he does this, we win, he's actually going to do it. It's a, it's a hidden trick that Chinese masters use. Maybe I am going to do this as well, and he's going to do their blundering the knight. You just have to call it out loud, and it's going to happen. Look. Oh, he plays rook g7. Never mind. Okay, now, look how nicely the bishop activates. You really want to remember uh, this kind of concept to kind of maximize your piece. And then I think we try this, or I think I can bring the rook and just brutally sacrifice. Yeah. Still, gotta be very careful, not a lot of time on the clock. 
And I just want to like sacrifice and get in uh, full force. I'm not even like taking the rook because I feel like we can get uh, an easier route to the checkmate. So, uh, like really hoping that we're going to get this, you know? <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty nice little positional squeeze here. Just kind of maneuvering the life out of my opponent. True, he didn't do much, but... Uh, like, a lot of people really have a hard time winning when opponent is just chilling. Because they tend to just self-destruct, because they don't know how to attack. Well, hopefully this is going to be, you know, like a little piece that uh, you can have in mind when your opponent plays passive uh, against the against the Zuckert heart. So uh, he plays rook to f7, can we queen sack? I'm gonna play g6, just because it's a very nice move. And uh, it's... Oh, shit. Messed it up. <laughs> I thought it's checkmate, but it was not. Okay. <laughs> I almost... um Just because I wanted to, like, DM at the end, I could have taken, obviously. I wanted to do g6, thinking he takes, we get checkmate. I also thought this, we have queen h7, but... Then I just realized, wait a second, there's this rook that is actually not sleeping, he's just defending. So I was like, oh no, I gotta make a move in time. But we finally managed to get a game. So, it was a little bit of a pity that uh, he hanged the queen there. But you really wanna, like, first figure out, uh, okay, we got a very juicy square. We usually need to get the knights over. How do we get this bad boy over? You try to look for a fast route, okay? I chose this. Usually there's like multiple routes, like could have been this as well. Um, actually, you know what? I'm not sure if this step is going to be in insanely uh, effective. But I remember a book that I read uh, a while ago that uh, had, you know, some kind of like positions and uh, it gave us an exercise to uh, try to kind of... Uh, you know, not about uh, solving move-by-move -move stuff, but literally finding uh, quick routes for the knights. Because for a lot of people, it would just seem impossible to get this knight over f4. You know, it's like the knight doesn't move in a line. <laughs> I know, dude, trust me. But if you practice this a little, you get a good hang of these, like, somewhat longer maneuvers and... Uh, the key thing here is not to look for a direct blow because it is a pretty close position where calculation, even if, say, you're a great calculator, it is not going to be the most important skill, okay? Like, imagine uh, you're a great uh, marathon runner. I put you in the pool. You don't know how to swim. Dude, you're going to be bad. So even though you're, like, fit, you're going to have a hard time because you don't have the right technique. Same here. Calculating, not going to take you very far. But actually improving uh, your pieces, like the knight first, then you see bishop not doing much. And then like maybe the rook, and then maybe a pawn break. This is how you like sort of uh, easily get yourself uh, onto the right path in close positions. So we got the knight there, and it's a pity he blundered. Otherwise, I would have done this, would have gone rook over. Honestly, I don't think we would have been uh, able to like really break. Like if I want to break over the king side, I have to move my queen around and push the h pawn. Maybe move my king around, get this rook over. Or I can just change strategy at this point. It could also be interesting to play uh, for a queen side break. Like imagine he does nothing, okay, just for kind of like instructive purposes. You let's say like get the bishop onto d6, you play c4, you play c5. And then uh, you pretty much forget about playing on the king side and you just try to break with b5 and win on the queen side. This is very much a possibility and this is why usually having this uh, insane uh, space advantage such a great factor. And by the way, just because uh, you get to see why uh, the knight can be so strong on such square, let's say black makes it in the move. You have a tactic like knight takes on g6. Look. Cannot take us of the pin, and uh, if pawn takes, there is uh, gonna be checkmate. This is actually checkmate, yes. So, getting into the habit of improving uh, every single one of your pieces, as long as, uh, you know, the position allows it, meaning that uh, your opponent doesn't have any, like, active moves. So, if he's tied down, this is, like, a great moment to kind of pause 
And before you rush for the, let's say, killer blow, you can just make sure all of your pieces are optimized. And uh, then when you go for the aggressive punch, you're sure you're going to be covered. So, uh, yeah, remember that. And just saw the nice little setup in action. And with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Everybody getting uh, another white game. Gonna open up with uh, D4 and... Okay, expecting d5 in this rating range, but uh, maybe it is going to be something different, so... Alright. We get to face the d6 setup. In the d6 setup, we're going to be doing the same thing. So, we are playing knight of 3. That is just the typical way to get started. And then we develop the normal e3, knight d2, bishop d3 kind of thingy. I may be expecting a Fianchetto from our opponent, but we shall see. Because if he is going to be weird, he's going to play e6. We still uh, don't know yet, but uh, I guess we're about to find out pretty soon. That's with the move c6, which I don't think should necessarily change uh, the way we play our opening. So we're going to do bishop to d3. This is usually the square for the bishop, unless opponent goes for like something like bishop to f5 quickly, because usually I'm not a fan of uh, trading bishops. Uh, okay, we see queen to a5 check. What do we think of this move? So, we pretty much have a choice between c3, bishop d2, or knight b2, d2, or you can trade queens, I guess. Which one do you think uh, should be the best move, considering the fact that uh, our setup is something like this? Pause the video, think about it, because here you can think, oh, I'm gonna block with a bishop and get a tempo, hit the queen. Well, yes, but that's because you're thinking about it in the short term, okay? You wanna be having more of like a long-term uh, view over these things. You don't want to misplace your pieces just because you feel good for like a second. So, you know, it's like, let's say uh, you're traveling uh, by bus and uh, I don't know, it's like a very crowded bus and you get to touch a female by accident. What, are you going to be like happy about it? No, don't be a creep, okay? Just uh, play knight b to d2. Mind your own business. We're going to get castle, play b3, bishop to b2 and get our desired Call it Zuckertor setup. Okay, he plays e5. Now, if you're paying attention to this, e5 comes with a bit of a, a bit of a hidden threat. In a way that if you play b3, you're gonna be losing the game. I mean, probably. So problem with b3 is that there's a pin that uh you're probably forgetting about. So he can go for the move e4. And notice that bishop takes, knight takes, just puts uh black in a winning position. Because e4 is going to be an unpleasant fork. So for this reason, we want to unpin. So we unpin by playing the very natural castle. Alright? Typically, I would say you want to castle in most of the Tsukarto positions. There are some occasions where it makes sense to kind of delay it for a little. But I would say those are like pretty rare. So okay, now part of our plan would be b3. However, I see potentially something that can be pretty annoying. So, b3, bishop, b2, if we can get that, we are a happy camper. However, on b3, I'm wondering, what if opponent tries to, you know, taste the, the waters with his fingers by playing queen c3, hitting the rook? I don't know, that may look terrifying. However, the queen would be pretty lonely in our camp, so I think the queen is potentially getting exposed, so... Very, you know, simple thing, rook b1. Maybe there are ideas to sacrifice the rook, but this would have been the simplest, so... That's why uh, I didn't really care about it too much. And now we're actually also creating a threat, so the e5 knight takes. Okay, you want to be really careful, because opponent may just uh, forget about it. You want to really get into the habit of looking for undefended pieces. Okay, he plays knight b to d7. 
Now this is becoming interesting because it's actually uh, the first sort of uh, important moment of the game because the opening phase has kind of ended and it is time to find a plan, okay? Maybe uh, what most people struggle with. So, as I mentioned in the first game, it is usually about uh, playing knight e5, which is not a possibility here, or using a move like e4. Okay, objectively speaking, I don't think e4 is like really the best move, like knight c4, maybe like a4 in the future, just somehow not allowing this could be very tempting, but I'm going to stick with my word. It's either knight e5 or e4 once you finish development. That's going to give you a nice little initiative. So I'm going to stick with e4, not because it's the best move, but just because uh, it is a very good practical move in general. So going to do this and uh, next up we can just expand. Now, once you realize uh, e4 has been played, first of all, he does not have any threats of playing e4 himself. And we can go for more of like a, like a squeeze. Okay, he plays uh, that. I'm going to start with the knight. Which is pretty much just forcing him to go on to c7. Why is he forced to go to c7? Which he did. Because we've got way too many threats over the e5 pawn. Wait, can we actually just take it? Yeah, I think we may have had this in the past and I just miscalculated. Did that actually happen? Have you guys, uh, have you guys noticed? I think in this position, yeah, we had knight c4, just like literally winning a pawn. How did you miss it? Okay, I can miss things. I'm a retired player. I'm a coach. But you are the one that's actually trying to improve, so you should have seen it. Anyways... <laughs> I'm obviously just kidding. Uh, you're gonna miscalculate things here and there, but uh, as long as you stick with the basics, uh, it is not gonna be a problem. So just literally winning a free pawn, you know, we just developed by the book and just win. <laughs> I mean, it is not gonna be like that every single one of your games, but it is gonna be like that a good chunk of your games, so. <laughs> I hope that makes any sense. Can I take with a bishop? Hitting the queen. Okay. Because we are having the extra pawn, it is very important that uh, we're doing trades. I'm thinking on d6, not messing up the structure for a specific reason. Because I saw the winning move that white has here. So pause the video if you want. Because we want to go e5. Collating the knight, and then uh, we need to kind of speed up a little just to uh, convert this extra piece position. I think it would be, you know, kind of giving me the best chances to go for an endgame, but uh, I mean, for a mating attack, but I'm going to go for endgame. Just because uh, this is how you should play. I don't have a lot of time to like finish this, but I'm going to play for tricks. So I'm starting this. Happy to trade if he wants. I also had 96 on previous move. Uh, okay. I'm gonna use this cheapo, but it's not amazing. <laughs> okay, he takes, I don't mind. Bishop d3, just getting a good control over this side. Expanding would be nice. King f2 coming. Maybe g3, why not? Open up the file. Oh! Happy to trade, because that's going to give me a lot of pre-moves available. Yeah, h3, g4. Honestly, if he doesn't do any dirty stuff, we should be able to easily win. Oh, that was kind of dirty. Oops. What am I doing? Okay, he gave me a passer, that's nice. He's starting the dirtiness. So pretty much you just want to be pretty moving like this whole time. Okay. Hopefully we're not going to be stalemating. But <laughs> hopefully we're going to wake up in a winning possession. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kind of like trying to guess the moves of his king at this point. 
Yeah, he's trying to obviously set up a stalemate. Good for him if he finds it. I don't mind if we stalemate. You're gonna stalemate occasionally when you do things like this, but uh, yeah, I think that's less important. It is important that you just focus on uh, playing better rather than this uh, like time scramble shenanigans. Um, looks like he did just rage quit and he's gonna hand us the win. So uh, even better, <laughs> even better. Uh, okay, so pretty much what you've seen happening in this game was first of all Queen A5 a very typical uh, sort of beginner mistake. I would say, like if he wants to be clever, he can play E5 immediately. Okay. Why is E5 interesting? Oh, uh, we can just go ahead and take a free pawn. This is not a good move. Yeah, that is what it looks like. I agree. But remember, you do this. Now black to play and win. Okay, because there is the same motive. Queen e5. So you don't need to start with it, okay? You can just do e5 immediately as black. Okay, I probably just need to stop this from getting played. Maybe just go knight d2 and uh, castle b3 and do that. Important that you play knight d2. And yeah, for some reason, I just didn't realize knight c4 is winning a pawn. That was like a strange uh, uh, miscalculation there. Uh, just free pawn, take it, it's yours, pick it up, go home with it. Brag, uh, brag about it to your parents, maybe your friends if you have any. That's yours. Uh, forgot about that and uh, I play the, what I feel like it's a good move in general, e4, just kind of expanding and... Uh, Okay, when he plays c5, he's like really asking for it. So, took that, won the free piece, and uh, the endgame should be pretty easy. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody, we managed to find uh, another wide game uh, right after the other one. So, when I play d5, finally, something that seems to be a little bit more standard. We're going to play knight of three nonetheless, and... Uh, Okay, in my opinion, if you made it like this far into the video, uh, I think this is by far the most common setup that I would be expecting. Below like 1400 blitz, maybe like 1700 rapid, somewhere around that. Uh, they do this and probably the knight to f6 right after. We're gonna play e3. Anyway, it's just doing uh, <laughs> what we usually do. And he plays a6, that is actually very interesting. A6 is an interesting move because, well, what can happen when they play knight f6, I think you get, uh, you know, starting knight b to d2 and then against bishop to g4, you get a great opportunity after something like this to play bishop to b5 and the knight is very weak in a lot of lines. I'm going to show uh, what I mean after the game. Uh, but yeah, A6 obviously uh, deals with all of that. <laughs> it's just going to go knight to d2. And probably bishop to d3. I just want to be a little bit careful. Because uh, if he gets in knight before, that could be a little annoying. So I think before we play it, I'm going to start with a3. I could also start with b3. You know, like a3, e6. I just want to kind of uh, make sure he's not going to be in time with something like that. So I'm going to do b3. I think that's just a little bit more... Uh, Precise uh, in this scenario. And expecting him to kind of play bishop g4 sooner or later. Just goes knight e4, however. Which I think it is a very common sort of inaccuracy mistake. Because I think you have two ways of pretty much dealing with it. What I think usually to be the first reaction that I have in my mind is... We just take 24 and then move the knight around. He just has a weak pawn and he needs to babysit for the rest of the game. Okay, that's a thing. But also, you can just play bishop b2, ignore it. He trades, fine. You're like ahead in development. If he plays like ultra aggressive f5, then uh, I meant uh, here, the square becomes weak. But I'm just gonna try to go ahead and punish. So it takes a simple move attacking. Now, if he plays f5, the bishop is gonna be passive forever. If you plays bishop f5, I'm going to show you a very cheeky idea. 
may just win us the game on the spot. Okay, now, I don't think necessarily that the move that I am about to play is uh, technically the best. But practically, it is going to be the best. I think it's going to be a useful move anyways to have uh, and something that you want to have in mind against bishop to f5. But honestly, I think if you play positional here, here, c4, f3, slow play, um, that's how it goes. You can play h4, however, and I think that's just making it very tricky for this bishop because people would just play e6 here, completely ignore. Like, if he finds h6 or h5, good for him, dude. He's paying attention to the game. But too many players in this rating range just do e6. It goes completely unnoticed. <laughs> I'm telling you, okay? Now you just go g4, punish. Typical idea that you want to have in mind against the bishop to f5 lines. You play h4 and... Uh, even when you are not winning a piece, now he just sacrificed the bishop because he was about to get trapped, but... Let's say even if this is not winning a piece, uh, you are usually doing this when he is castled. So, you're gonna get like great attack with these pawns, okay? It's a good idea anyways, it's not like a cheap, just a cheap trick as it may look to some of you. Okay, he's attacking my pawn on c2. Uh, some people would freak out playing king d1. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, in fact, pretty sure queen e4 just uh, deals with the issue just fine. You could also do queen d1, but I'm just gonna pick up the free pawn. Why is f5 uh, not a good move? Because it's leaving e6 undefended, okay? And he actually just forgets about it too. So we take, we check. He has no time to collect there. And per probably and possibly we trade queens. And then we just get to defend. Okay, I got easy move defending. I can also take and defend. <laughs> I think I'm just going to take because I'm, uh, I'm a greedy little bastard. And he goes in. <laughs> <laughs> Fully aggressive mode. Like, okay, we got that under control. We got that covered. <laughs> Just gonna take and... Uh, starting with a check. Now I wanna get knight to g5. Threatening a little checkmate. Uh, and uh, I think... That's a little bit too aggressive. Because uh, he is just pretty much eliminating a pawn that's... Was keeping my rook kind of uh, inactive on the file. Okay, opponent going uh, full uh, family gambit. He's literally gambiting his wife at this point, just giving away every single one of my pieces. But but look, it is it's just, just the meta at low rated games. He plays rook f2 because obviously d knight does not move backwards. It is just it's been added in like the recent patch. This was not a thing so far. They just cannot keep an eye on these things, I'm telling you. So you're just taking. And... Yeah, whatever. I'm I'm gonna do this, just hopefully he's gonna do another queen blunder. I think he's gonna check just fine, though. <laughs> this time, it would have been, like, hilarious if he did. Threatening to mate, okay? It's like, uh, I, I can do checkmate in <laughs> million different ways here. So, just gonna end the game in this way, and... Uh, yeah. So, I'm gonna actually just go ahead and show you a few of the ideas that I mentioned in the opening. We're gonna talk about this idea as well. So, first of all, he played a6. I mentioned this move is interesting. Uh, why is this actually interesting even? So, what I believe you are gonna be facing in uh, most of your games, it is a move like knight f6, okay? Because people think, okay, I just gotta develop knights. This is what you see in kind of the majority of the chess tutorials, which is true. Like, usually the knights are better developed before bishops. But in closed games, okay, to begin with, the knight on c6 is not really well placed. Just in closed games, that is pretty typical, a misplaced knight, because it is uh, not giving black the typical counterplay connected with c5. So it, it would be better for him to try to do something like this, have the knight behind the pawn, okay? This is why people, uh, I mean, people that are not familiar with the Juba Falun, which is definitely a good opening that you should be checking out on the channel. This is why most people play c4 and then uh, play Queen's Gambit to have the knight behind the pawn. This is just uh, how the strategy in closed games works. 
Just look how much uh, more versatile you are. You have ideas like this. You have pressure on the center. So already 96 is a mistake. But it's not a losing game kind of mistake. Plays a6 and most of your opponents are going to do this. Well, we play knight e2 because that's, you know, the Tsukar thought move order. And again, something like bishop out, whether it's f5 or g4, you have this very cunning idea that you may have seen uh, in my London system uh, course if you, uh, if you got it. But there is this little trick works very similar because they play the Chigorin and on e6, knight to e5, black is having a very hard time dealing with the spin. The queen d6, you got to move like c4. They are not careful. You play c5, you're winning everything. Okay, queen d8 takes. Mainly, you're just winning, winning the exchange on the pawn. So, same thing on bishop g4. I recommend h3 and then bishop to b5. And uh, let's say they play e6. Now, important, do not play knight e5. Okay, you don't want to give up on the queen. Uh, but, break the pin. And then, you're jumping with a horsey. And similar ideas like c4 and uh, white is getting a very nice initiative. So that's first about this. You play knight e2 and if e6 you play b3, bishop b2, get this, knight e5 kind of stuff and uh, that's fine. But then second of all, I want to show you how I actually came up with the age for idea during the game, yeah? You saw me play this. As I was telling, like, you can probably look at it with a computer or something like this uh, is better and just play with F3. I think white is definitely better. I'm kind of surprised that uh, computer thinks this is close to equal. Uh, it really doesn't look like that. I think black is kind of ruined strategically. But I was able to come up with this whole idea because I'm just kind of... Uh, used to this from the bishop f5 stuff. So I told you, I don't really like to trade. I think it's okay, but uh, my favorite plan here, which is, you know, according to the computer, is not going to give you an objective advantage. But I think it is very tricky for your opponent. So we play knight to b, b to d2. We can start with b3 uh, as well. Let's just say we do like knight e2. They play e6. Let's just say black does some kind of... Reverse Luna system kind of business, yeah? They get castle, play bishop to e2. Let's say they do like c6, whatever, yeah? And then uh, you can go ahead and utilize this uh, sort of knight e5 idea. Okay, let's say they play knight b to d7 or the take, doesn't matter. And then important that we're not rushing with castling against this because you have h4. That is like the very sneaky little approach that you can use. Okay, and this is going to give you a very interesting uh, attack. Like just imagine if they take and play knight e4, black already lost. Why? Well, because of multiple moves, but simply this idea of playing g4. Like if he takes, we don't mind, like bishop is still trapped. And you get him. So this is one of... Uh, my interesting ideas against uh, bishop to f5, so keep that, keep that in mind. Hopefully we're going to get to play it in uh, some of the following games, so with that being said, I think uh, we can just go ahead and try to find uh, a new opponent. All right, everybody, looks like we managed to just get uh, the third white game in a row. We'll take it, and uh, we're going to be going for another little uh, Zuckertor, so just knight f3. When I'm playing uh, very meta so far. But now we get the bishop to g4. Okay? Question is, should we just go completely aggressive, trying to just refute this, or should we keep the setup opening? I think just because the way we've been playing it so far, I'm gonna go for the like less aggressive option, and I'm gonna probably play either 92 or 83. But the best move in the position it is actually knight e5. Just targeting the bishop. This is not a good move. Okay, the knight is not like pin, so I can just jump and attack this bishop. If you're like curious to check this out, uh, we actually had uh, a lot of these in the lower uh, rated games from the London system rating climb. Because uh, in the London system, I also like to start with the knight, so it's the same position. Now on this, however, I'm gonna play the Tsukar third way. 
So I'm just going to do an ID too, just being able to recapture uh, with a knight, just in case. And this still can go many ways. You can develop both knights, yeah, and actually just transpose to one of the positions that uh, I have just mentioned in the analysis. So hopefully we're going to get that and I can show you. So, okay, great. Starting h3, very important. And now he's probably going to take, which is kind of spoiling the fun. Because it's the inferior move. But okay, he plays bishop to f5. Which is still very interesting because... Okay, do you remember now uh, what white is supposed to do? Dude, I like literally showed it like five minutes ago. Are you even paying attention to the video? Come on. We need to get you focused because this is literally one of the most common ideas that you really need to remember. Because this is going to happen a lot. You have no idea. Gonna get this set up uh, as you are getting started. Maybe not with h3, but it doesn't change anything, so. Point is, you wanna remember who is the target, okay? Knight is a target in this structure. We start with a bishop. On a6, we take, or in the pawns, and on e6, uh, we just jump. These are the moves that I would be expecting you to face. In bishop d7, I mean, we can just like play. I don't know, something, maybe just b3 and then go back. Oh, bishop to d7, wow. I actually guessed it. It's very rare, but I've seen this getting played occasionally, so. Point is now on a6, you can take back with the bishop, so it no longer makes uh, that much sense. Okay, now we have a choice between a bunch of moves. But remember, we wanna meet a6 with bishop d3 without allowing knight to b4. So we can either do, uh, either go for c3 or a3. Now, we usually don't want to play c3 because we want to go bishop there and that would be restricting it. So for this reason, I think it's logical to play a3. a6 just uh, slide it back. If e6, uh, we want to rush with this, I think it's important. Else, uh, if you castle, he may be in time with bishop d6, e5 that you don't want to allow. So I want to play b3 first. Then bishop to b2 and make sure we're like stopping e5. That is like really important. You really need to watch out for that threat. Okay, it is only one thing that you need to dodge in these positions when he has the passive bishop. So okay, he goes for fianchero, which is definitely, I think, it is not the worst, but it is also not great. So we're going to castle. And... He's probably going to get a uh, castle as well. And just because the bishop is not doing a whole lot on b5, I'm going to maneuver it myself. And I really want you to look at the position. And just notice how b this bishop on d7 being restricted by the pawn. Yeah, notice he wants to do e5. So it's very important to understand that the bishop on d7 is literally feeling like a butterfly that is trapped inside of a closed jar. It is just bad, okay? You cannot do much, you know? So, as long as you have that on the agenda, you're fine. Okay, some of you may be wondering, oh, isn't the bishop on b2 passive as well because it's so restricted by the pawn? Well, it is different because this bishop, look how nicely it's spying over e5. This bishop, doing nothing. Just play knight e5. Also, interesting move is uh, predisposition e4. 95 e4 are the attacking moves, remember that. But I'm just gonna stick with 95 f4 whenever it's possible. For the beginning at least, because I think it's easiest to understand. He should definitely take, because this nice is kind of misplaced. What are we doing in case he doesn't? That's like very important to, let's say if black does nothing, what is white supposed to do, okay? Same here. Because a lot of people go ahead, oh yeah, yeah, I got the idea, this is very logical. But when they get to play it, they don't. For some reason, it's just like that. So a lot of people go about these things, kind of ignoring it, saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I know this, I understand. No, but like, seriously, do you? Okay, why to play? If you've been paying attention, I already had this. It is the Pillsbury Knight. So reinforce it with f4, um, basically, as soon as you can. And hopefully he plays f6, because it's going to be a very kind of instructive mistake, I feel like. I mean, he can very well just take with a knight and give us the open file. I don't mind either. But f4, once you get this, 
This is the good stuff. Just please random move on the side, okay, we don't mind. Now, question is, how do we make progress? Queen sack. When, when you don't know what to do, you do queen sack. No, okay. You can consider it, but it's not working. So I think first, I want to start with g4, just getting uh, rid of the knight, and my intuition tells me f5 is a good move there. But I'm not going to play it. I'm going to, like, slowly improve. Queen to f3, and I think king g2, rook h1, h4, h5. Slow play. I can also just do f5. Honestly, it might be even, uh, like, a quicker finish. f5 looks super strong, but it's kind of opening up his pieces as well. So, in this position, because I have a choice between, like, two plans, by the way, we meet a4 b with b4. I'm just gonna go for uh, the one that is, uh, I feel like it's harder for my opponent to deal with. So he plays rook f8, kind of uh, defending that. I think that's good for him. But I really don't see how he's willing to defend against this simple thing. For a lot of people, okay, it may feel like uh, we're kind of overextended having the king on g2. It feels like that, but it's not an issue because the opponent literally has no pieces nearby. So when there are no pieces, you're completely safe, okay? Remember. Something is weak, only if you can attack it, all right? Like, very uh, important. So, I'm going to be taking towards the center, opening up this file. It has to play knight e8, only move, and then... Still, this plan would be interesting, but it's going to be kind of a little more difficult to, you know, just deliver. So... I think we're going to start with queen g3. Okay, this is just a free pawn that I'm going to take. I'm just going to speed up a little. Only like 30 seconds left. Uh, hitting this. So he has to play like c6 not to lose another pawn. I don't care about pawns too much at this point. I care more about activity. So I'm just going to like play queen g3. Double up. Maybe g5 fixing the weak pawn. If he breaks with f6, maybe that's uh, kind of complicating it a little. So I just want to make sure we fix the weakness. Then we... Maybe, maybe just here. Also, rook f4 could be good. I'm not sure if we need uh, the queen to kind of visualize over that. Uh, probably not, honestly. So, I may very well just go this way. Okay, c5 uh, gives me idea to play this. I think I'm just going to d5. I think we want to activate the bishop if we can. But I think I sort of uh, underestimated uh, bishop to e6 as a move. Uh, he goes there. That's not a good move. He's going to do bishop there, but I think we have c4 or rook d1. c4 gives him b5 ideas, so I think instead I'm just going rook d1. I'm not really threatening to take, as then my bishop remains hanging, but I'm going to play this move next, kind of no matter what. So this is a thing now, with his queen being uh, onto the thingy. And I also want to show you like a nice idea that I think you can generally use, which is rook f6. It's sort of a positional sack. If he takes, he's probably getting smothered mated. Yeah. If I can get my queen there, that is gg. Uh, okay, I think he's getting a little bit too horny with that. Not going to allow... Uh, any checks? And if we avoid checks, this is going to be a mate. Okay? He's going to take, excited. But this should be the last nail in the coffin. Like, Quinito is not a thing and he has no checks. And we win on time, but mate was literally unstoppable. So, okay. So, one important thing that I forgot to mention uh, during the game is that in this position, my opponent could have played uh, f6, okay? And it is very tempting to throw in a move like knight takes on g6, you know. Close your eyes and hope for the best. No, actually, I think this is uh, definitely a very serious candidate. However, in this particular case, opponent could have taken, and then uh, the saving move is knight g3. Not only knight g3, but after rook f3, he has knight f5. And the position becomes somewhat unclear. It's still relatively balanced. But I wouldn't recommend you play this way. And therefore, on f6, it is better to stick with a simple knight takes on d7. He has to take with a queen. 
then notice that the knight is uh, poorly placed. So we go g4. They are very lucky, okay, just not to get their knight trapped immediately. So they have to rely on this knight g3 move. But after rook f3, black needs to come up with the desperado knight e4. Which is, you know, saving the piece, but losing the pawn to the other hand. So he can just take twice and uh, white is just much better. I think opening uh, was very important. Just watch out the way we play this. I think a3 is very nice. Obviously, you got other ways of playing this, but I think uh, if you are trying to stick with this very simple and basic setup, a3 should be the way to go. And then uh, you get this kind of thematic position, and I'm telling you, you have a choice between knight e5, e4, and you have good position. Yeah, just... Uh... <laughs> I mean, according to the chess.com engine, knight e5 and e4 are not even among the top five moves, which is like a very ridiculous, but it's obviously a very kind of strange position the way he played it, so... 95 definitely good, e4 also very fine. Uh, so, yeah, and then queen to f3 just gave away a uh, free pawn. He should have played here and probably tried to break with f6, but I don't think uh, uh, would have been good. There's just a bishop difference at this point. Uh, yeah, probably we play either knight f3 or takes. I'm um, not even sure which one is best. Yeah, knight f3 and takes among the best moves. Would be expecting like knight f3 and then h4, h5, just looking at the hook and trying to get pressure because of the bishop. But to show you what uh, the evil plan was with this king g2 move, let's say if he basically plays rook to b8, we go like rook h1. Let's say he goes b5. Let's say he just does nonsense. Okay, whatever. Let's say he does whatever. Like queen move. You want to push this. And then when they take, you're not recapturing, okay? Really want to remember this trick. Because we just move forward. Knight has to leave. Then you take with the queen. And you win. So. Just play king to g2, I kind of guessed f5 is interesting, but I just feel like we're opening uh, his pieces for no reason, so... Did this, he gave us free pawn, and uh, yeah, then, okay, d5 was really not a move that we are supposed to do, I just kind of panicked uh, due to lack of time and uh, small pp, so... Uh, could I play rook to f6, you know, very well, that was a thing, I think it's very underrated move, and... Uh, yeah, like here at the end, in case you're wondering uh, whether he could have defended better, like let's say to do, I don't know, like let's say king here, rook g8. I don't think it's saving here for because of a move like e6 and notice how he can like literally checkmate with the Zucker third bishop. But uh, also one pattern that you need to have in mind. I'm not saying it was working here, but if you could... There is this very nice little queen sack with a pawn on f6 that uh, you want to be aware of. So, all right, I think uh, we actually managed to go through like a lot of setups and uh, this should pretty much be a very decent uh, introductory guide if you're uh, looking forward to pick up the Kole Zuckertor. I think it is a very um, easy to play and uh, underrated opening. So thanks a lot. Uh, for making it this far into the video, and hopefully I'll see you around on the channel. Take care.